Hey everybody, thanks for taking a minute to sit down with me. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about building and executing a strategy for service digitization. We've got a lot to cover, so I'm just going to jump straight into it. Um, first of all, just a little bit about me. My name is Casey Kinsey. I'm the founder and CEO of Lofty, and we are a software consultancy that helps organizations reimagine service delivery with digital products. So over the years, we've helped a ton of different firms find ways to use software either internally in their business or uh, found software tools that they could put in front of their customers as a, a direct product that they sell. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to use the term digital product a lot, and I want to define that quickly so that we're on the same page. Uh, a digital product is a software tool by which your customers or your employees interact with your firm. And that can come in the form of a lot of different things. Web applications, mobile applications, tablet applications, cloud-based platforms. These are all examples of what are called digital products. Uh, in fact, every business uses a ton of at least off-the-shelf software any piece of software that you work with is a digital product of some sort. So when we talk about building digital products, we're really talking about custom digital products, right? Um, the firms that you use off-the-shelf tooling from, that's their digital product. We're talking about creating digital products for our clients, for those firms to use. Uh, and there are a number of different reasons why it might make sense to build a digital product. The first of which is the ability to gain competitive advantages. So I think everyone can think of examples of how software has helped their business run more efficiently. Maybe there's certain software you just couldn't operate without because it manages your workflows. Anything that's off the shelf uh, can definitely give you efficiency, but all of your competitors also have access to it, especially if it's some industry standard software. Having a custom digital product uh, has the ability to create built-in competitive advantages because your competitors can't access it. Um, you can build digital products to actually productize the firm's knowledge. Whatever industry you're in, whether that's engineering, agriculture, what have you, uh, you can take the firm's knowledge, what you know well and what you do best, and actually make that itself a product. Um, that, in turn, can give you access to new markets. So there's a lot of opportunity, potentially, to uh, reach customers that were previously unreachable by giving them a self-service model or offering something at a different price point. There's a lot of different ways in which new markets can be accessed through digital product. Strategically, there may be interest from the leadership of the organization to boost the intellectual property portfolio. Um, so obviously anything that you buy off the shelf, you're licensing from someone else. Um, you can take that license spend and put it into an internal product uh, and you're building up IP, you're building up an asset. And then finally, you have the opportunity through custom products to consolidate the off-the-shelf tooling you're currently using. So uh, whether that's taking multiple tools that you have to uh, work to integrate and building that into one or, or what have you, you can definitely see some opportunities to consolidate by building you know, one tool that does multiple things in the way that your firm operates. And there are a lot of archetypes um, that you can think of, of just ideas of the types of products uh, an, an organization might build from reporting tools, workflow and process management, to really complicated things like artificial intelligence uh, being used to assist in delivery. Um, I've, these are a few examples I have written here. If you're interested in this, you might be interested in our ebook, uh, Opportunities for Software Products in Digital Firms. Uh, and you can get to that at higherlofty.com forward slash ebook. So we're talking about strategy today, how to build a strategy around digital products. Now, why is it important to focus on strategy first? Well, spoiler, creating brand new technology is inherently very, very risky. Um, it is expensive. The, the labor to uh, build these products is, is not cheap. And the amount of labor that goes into building a digital product is, is pretty large. And so a framework for digitizing your firm or going through digital transformation or however you want to phrase it um, should absolutely be designed to drive risk out of the equation. 
It's inherently risky. Thus, you need strategy to mitigate that risk. Um, so we're going to talk about how uh, to build a digitization strategy. And this is going to be based on the framework that we actually use here at Lofty with our customers uh, when we're helping them design their strategy. And it starts first with defining a known outcome. See, a lot of strategy or at least digitization efforts start with a solution, um, a, a product. Wouldn't it be cool if? Um, and that's great, but if you don't first start with outcomes and work your way forward, uh, you run the risk of being a solution in search of a problem or not accurately capturing the needs of the end user because you're too focused on the solution uh, to really be able to measure uh, how successful it is at actually solving a problem. So we start with outcomes. I've got two categories here. Uh, we're, we're thinking broadly right now. Uh, Outcomes fit probably into one of two categories. You either are looking to increase efficiency, maybe reducing your cost of services by saving your production staff time. Maybe you want to reduce overhead by saving administrative staff time or customer support time. Or you want to reduce uh, account turnover, which in turn saves you uh, sales dollars. Uh, on the other side, you might be interested in driving new revenues. So primarily through software, that means opening up opportunities to license that software. More specifically, that can be the software as a service business model, which is a form of licensing, uh, but gets turned into annualized ongoing revenue. Um, and at the end of the day, if you're delivering more valuable client results, there's you know opportunities there uh, that maybe you can move from, if, if say you have a, a, a system that is built or a, a service that's built time and materials. Well, if you can deliver more consistent, more timely client results, you have an opportunity to maybe start pricing that on value and therefore unlocking new revenue. So these are general types of outcomes that I think every business can look at and say, yes, we, we seek to do these kinds of things. Uh, more specifically, when you look back a couple slides back where we, we talked about the reasons why you might build software. So maybe you want to reduce your cost of services while also building an asset. This can become very, very nuanced, um, but it's important to have a defined outcome first. And I think you'll see why as we move forward. It's only after we have an outcome defined that we can actually start thinking about the problems that we want to uh, solve for. Um, it's really easy to think of uh, outcomes as problems, and we make that distinction when we talk with our customers uh, because things like our, our, this service line is not profitable enough uh, sometimes gets identified as the problem. Okay, That's not actually a problem. Uh, it turns out that more profitable services is actually an outcome that you want to achieve. Uh, the problems are the things which are preventing that outcome uh, from coming together, right? So uh, if you have a known outcome to have a more profitable service, uh, if you treat that as a problem and immediately start trying to solve it, you haven't really identified, you know, if there wasn't a problem, wouldn't you have already achieved that outcome? So knowing what the outcome is, then you can start to identify which problems are preventing that. And from that, your team, uh, as, as much as, as the leadership can be involved, as many heads at the table, can come together and start thinking about, okay, what's actually preventing this? And there should be multiple problems. Um, you should be able to come up with multiple key problems that are preventing your outcome. And then you need to get aligned on them, right? So we like to get all of these ideas out on the table, get the team together, voting works really well here, um, get everyone to decide on a top set, maybe three or five problems that you really want to focus in on. Um, that way everyone's aligned on, on what they think uh, the problems are. And only then, after you have those key problems defined, is it time to start thinking about potential solutions. Um, for each of those key problems, there are multiple potential solutions that your team can come up with. And so if you're thinking about this framework, now we've got a place where we're actually coming up with solutions, but we're not just throwing solutions at more profitability, right? We're throwing solutions at an actual tangible problem we all agreed at that is preventing profitability. 
And solutions are always going to come with assumptions, okay? Actually, problems are as well. All of these things are, as, as we're making a strategy, we are coming up with ideas that are loaded with assumptions, and that's perfectly okay. That's what's going to happen. You just need to, at this point, start recognizing what your assumptions are because we need to actually test them. Um, it's important to get a lot of quantity for solutions here because we're building a strategy, and our strategy is not going to focus on having one path to success. We need to have multiple potential ways of solving the problem in order to make our strategy more bulletproof. One path to success is essentially designed for failure. There will be challenges along the way. Now, we talked about measuring what your assumptions are. That the reason why is we need to design experiments around our solutions. We need to not think about product development yet. We're not there yet. We need to find out what our assumptions are. We need to go vet those assumptions. And we need to know if we even need to write code to go test this solution. So hypothetically, um, say you know our desired outcome is we want to reduce client churn. And one of the problems the team honed in on is, uh, you know, we believe that it's taking too much time for the customer to interface with the service. Um, they're busy, and to, in order for the service to be delivered effectively, there's a lot of hands-on time with their account manager, with an engineer, whoever it is, right? Um, and we think that takes too much time. Now, if we have a potential solution that reduces the amount of time that the customer has to spend interfacing with the firm, that's something worth testing, right? But do we need to write code to test that? Maybe not. Can a detailed mock-up vet our assumptions? Can we actually draw out, you know, maybe this is just a data collection tool that keeps them from having to get on the phone uh, with your firm? Um, can we draw that out or can we mock it up and put it on an iPad and put it in front of them and say, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, uh, does this save you time? If so, that's a really good experiment. Some solutions will be inherently technical, okay? And if you do have to write some code, if you actually have to prototype something, then you need to know what the minimal feature set is so that you can be really focused on developing a prototype that you can test to see if your assumptions are correct. Um, if you have to prototype anything or if you want to build a mock-up, you need to know who your audience is. So who are we going to test this prototype with? Um, people that we can trust, that we know that we can get good answers from them. And then finally, how do we measure results? What is the definition of success or failure of this experiment, right? So we're designing the plan of what we might prototype, what we might build, what we think it's going to do, what problem we think it's going to solve, who we're going to show it to, whether or not they're going to be able to give us good feedback, and the definition of success. We need to do that for all of the solutions that we come up with in our strategy. And then finally, there's some amount of analysis that has to be done. We have a list of solutions. We have a list of experiments. Um, we need to triage them now. Because remember, the whole goal of building a digitization strategy is to drive risk out of the process. So at Lofty, we like to score solutions based on two pieces of criteria, uh, the complexity of the solution, how hard will it to be, be to build and test, versus how much impact we think that solution has against the problem. Remember, for any problem, multiple solutions. Some of them may impact the problem. They may seem like better solutions. Uh, and you don't have to be very accurate here or precise. We're not thinking of man hours or cost or anything at this phase. We're just thinking t-shirt sizes, right? Small, medium, large, extra large for both impact and complexity. And then once we score all of our potential solutions, now we can do some analysis on them. We like to use a four quadrant analysis, which you can see over here on the left side of the screen. Um, the idea is that low complexity things that make a big impact, these are quick wins and we want to prioritize those first. They're the lowest risk thing to get some results. Um, high complexity and high impact, uh, those are worth exploring, but they're going to be a little bit more risky. Now, if your outcome was to get a competitive advantage, these high complexity things, this is why we call them strategic disruptors. Uh, they're potentially disruptive because if you're able to pull it off, they were hard to build, which makes it harder for your customers to emulate. Low complexity, low impact, maybe uh, that's you know a final thing to visit. You can workshop those, see if you can drive the impact up, make them more like a quick win. And then finally, there are going to be things that are really hard to build that maybe don't make that big of an impact. 
It comes out all the time. These are the wouldn't it be cool if type solutions. Um, those are distractions. Recognize them. We want to prioritize low-hanging fruit in our strategy. Okay, so mapping all of this out, everything I just described, that's what you see in front of you. We have an outcome, we have a list of key problems preventing that outcome, and then for each key problem, we have multiple solutions and an experiment design that we're going to triage and analyze, and the output of that entire process is our strategy. It's a list of solutions, experiments on how we're going to test the feasibility of that solution, and it is prioritized by risk. And that, we think, makes a great overall strategy. Now, strategy without execution is not very useful. So I want to take a minute to talk about how to actually bring this to fruition, right? The best strategy in the world is worth nothing if you can't actually put boots on the ground and go out and implement it. Um, so... We talked about prototypes, we talked about experiments. In the software world, it's become very fashionable to call these minimum viable products. Um, and so we want to test our solutions in the form of minimum viable products, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's the minimal set of features that provides a viable solution to the problem. Okay? So we have multiple experiments and prototypes, we've ranked them by risk, and we want to build MVPs, minimum viable products, to go out and test them. Now, a misconception is that an MVP is a list of features for a software application. But like we talked about earlier, an MVP can be a drawing, right? It is truly whatever is the minimal amount of work that can prove viability. Um, and we're driving out risk by testing those things and measuring results early before we go out and try and build out this solution. When you are testing your experiment, testing your MVP, you have a decision to make after the experiment is over. Okay? If the minimum viable product proves the assumptions, if they are validated, then we can scale the product up. It's time to maybe go into product development. That's a, that is, this is a solution we can go after. The customer validated, it does solve their problem. Um, if not, you know, depending on how far off you are, you can either iterate on the MVP, you know, you get some feedback from the customer, go make some adjustments to your minimum viable product and rerun the experiment or move on to another potential solution. That's why we have a prioritized list that we can go through. So going back to our original example, um, it may be that we can't prove the problem uh, through the experiment. We might put uh, something in front of that, that customer and we said, hey, we think this will save you some time. They might say, well, it's actually not about the time that it takes. That's not, that's not really a problem for me, right? So there's, you know, it might not just be the solution. There's assumptions all the way up and down our strategy. So uh, if we find that out, that the problem's not even valid, then we can move forward in our strategy taking that into account. And it's important to know when to move on from an experiment. And I think the most important thing is to recognize, number one, that it's perfectly okay to abort the experiment, move on to the next one. Um, we designed our strategy so that we don't have all of our eggs in the same basket and recognize that failed experiments are a part of the process that we anticipate. Um, our solutions are targeting a problem that prevents an outcome. So if you can't prove that the problem is valid, like the example I just gave, it's time to move on. And you can cut all of the other experiments that seek to address that problem. Um, you might find out that the problem is valid, but the solution doesn't actually make an impact, right? So you might talk to that customer and say, hey, we think this will save you more time. And they look at it and they go, well, it would be nice to save me some time. However, this won't save me time because to get you this information that this form needs, I have to go talk to Bill and, and you know, someone's on vacation. And that's, that's just, that creates more problems for me. Um, so if you find out the solution isn't making an impact, you either need to readdress the experiment, try again, or move to another potential solution. Time boxes are very effective in execution to drive the process forward. So we like to set hard time limits on how long we're going to take to build the prototype and how long we're going to take to test it. That's going to incentivize efficiency. So everyone knows that they're trying to achieve goals within the timeline. And the team that's building that product and testing it wants it to be successful as well. It's also going to provide a backstop for indecision. Right? So if you're undecided about whether it's time to move forward or whether or not the assumption was vetted, it's okay to have a time box there. 
if you're indecisive about whether or not you've impacted the problem, I think we can objectively say it's probably not a great solution at that point. Um, so this is what that workflow looks like if you map it out. You know, our strategy is a stack of experiments. It's prioritized by risk, and we start at the top. We build an MVP. We run an experiment, and then we either make adjustments, iterate, redo the MVP, re-experiment. We decide that we've vetted our assumptions and we want to move forward, and we scale that up into full-blown, long-scale product development, uh, after which we can go back to our strategy for the next product or work on multiple products simultaneously. Or the experiment fails, and we just go back to our strategy and grab the next one. So this is sort of an endless loop, really, of executing strategy. And I think it's worth pointing out, you know, when you look at it this way, you can see that um, this process of strategy and execution kind of works in both directions. Uh, it's not just uh, strategy at the uh, organization level, right? Um, you start there and you build a strategy, but when it's time to go build a product, um, you need a product strategy as well. And so just like we have... Uh, at an organization level, our strategy might have multiple solutions, each of which is a potential product. At a product level strategy, you can do the same thing, drive an outcome, what are the key problems? Your solutions become, instead of products, features within that product. So this is a very adaptable workflow uh, for technical strategy. We've talked really abstractly at this point without getting too, into too much technical detail. We are talking about building software here, by the way. Um, so I'd like to just take a minute to talk about infrastructure um, because I think this is really important. Our goal should be to launch minimum viable products and iterate on them within days. We're not talking about weeks here. We want to be able to do this within days. And the cost and timeline of going out and building up servers, setting up infrastructure, that can be well over 25% of a product's time and cost. So this is a big uh, cost factor in the ability to execute multiple prototypes. And so we believe very strongly in designing a common infrastructure on which all of your prototypes can run so that you can build that once and you don't have to think about how we're going to go get servers um, what tech we're going to use, how we're going to launch it. Um, do that once. And if IT is shaking their head at you and saying you can't launch an app infrastructure in a day, um, tell them to come see me because you absolutely can do it. We do it every day. It just requires some specialized tooling and specialized knowledge to do it. And so again, this can be repeated as needed. Digitization is not a zero-sum game. You don't have to get it all right on the first time. You can revisit your strategy to explore totally different outcomes. Remember, everything we've talked about so far was to drive one outcome. Um, so if there are multiple initiatives or multiple potential outcomes you want to explore, you can do this process again looking at the problems associated with a different outcome. Uh, we like to say here at Lofty, hope is not a strategy. And if your strategy is we have an idea for a product and we're just going to go build it, um, you're really hoping that you've got it right. You're really hoping that you've got product market fit. You're really hoping that uh, your vision is aligned with the customer's needs. So we don't like to do that. A good strategy should anticipate challenges. It should anticipate that we don't know everything and provide a framework to overcome that when it inevitably happens. So that's how we think about strategy here at Lofty. If you're interested in having some help on this journey, I mean, I think you can take this information and put it to work right away. But if you want a hand in it, Ignition is our discovery and strategy service that our customers have, uh, have us work with them to guide them through the process. We have a series of workshops that build upon this framework I just laid out uh, to design strategy for both the organization and then also product strategy when it comes time to build something. And we're also an implementation house. So we've built a lot of products for a lot of different firms um, that have driven efficiency or created new revenues. So if you're interested in learning more, you can track me down. My email address is here, casey at higherlofty.com. You can go to our website, uh, find us that way. Track me down on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.